Hey guys, Dr. Shahid here, and in this video, we're going to talk about a couple special cases you should be aware of, namely cracked tooth syndrome and my favorite, vertical root fracture. Okay, let's start with cracked tooth syndrome. Cracked tooth syndrome is clinically characterized by a few things. First, we have sustained pain on release of biting pressures. We also have occasional, momentary, sharp, poorly localized pain during mastication that's very difficult to reproduce. And finally, we have sensitivity, typically to thermal changes and mild stimuli, such as sweet or acidic foods. Now, radiographic evidence of cracked tooth syndrome can only really be seen on cone beam CTs. Mesiodistal cracks in particular are near impossible to visualize on 2D radiographs since the line of fracture isn't in the same plane as the x-ray beam. Finally, let's talk about the incidence of cracked tooth syndrome. Permanent mandibular molars are the most commonly affected teeth, with recent research showing a greater incidence in the second molars, probably because of its close proximity to the hinge axis of the mandible. As you guys know, if you get closer to the TMJ, the masticatory efficiency increases, and so second molars will for sure take a greater beating than teeth anterior to them. All right, guys, let's now talk about how we can diagnose crack tooth syndrome. And there's really only two things here that help us diagnose the problem. We have transillumination, like we discussed earlier, or the use of a tooth sleuth, as seen in this image. Both of these tools can be used to help diagnose a cracked tooth. Now, with regards to treatment of the condition, it's really dependent on the status of the pulpal tissue. If you have a healthy pulp or reversible pulpitis, the tooth can be splinted with an orthodontic band and observed for improvement. Should the symptoms improve, a crown may be placed on the cracked tooth as a definitive treatment. In cases of irreversible pulpitis or pulp necrosis, you got to treat the endodontic problem first. So endodontic treatment followed by a full coverage restoration is indicated. We now know how to treat this condition, but what's the prognosis of the condition? And really, the prognosis is dependent on three main factors, or three questions rather. The first question is there a mesial or distal probing depth greater than five millimeters? This is the worst one, guys. If the answer is yes, we have a poor prognosis every single time. The second question, is the distal marginal ridge cracked? If the answer is yes, we automatically have a guarded prognosis. Distal marginal ridge cracks are a bad sign, guys, but they're not doomsday. Lastly, is there periapical pathology? And this one is similar to the cracked distal marginal ridge. The prognosis will be guarded. All right, let's go through this in a visual way so that it's easier to understand. I'm going to introduce four different scenarios and the resulting diagnosis for the case as well. So in this first situation, we have a cracked tooth that does not have a deep probing depth. It has an intact distal marginal ridge and no periapical pathology. In this case, the diagnosis is favorable. And all we have to do is either put an orthodontic band over it, as we discussed previously, and a crown later, if the ortho band alleviates symptoms, or we simply initiate root canal therapy and a final restoration if the tooth is deemed necrotic or irreversibly inflamed. All right, let's go to our second scenario. This time, we have a cracked tooth with no large probing depths on the mesial or distal. We have an intact distal marginal ridge, but we have periapical pathology which indicates a necrotic process. In this situation, the prognosis is guarded. Third case, we have a cracked tooth, this time no periapical pathology and no large probing depths, but we have a cracked distal marginal ridge. And again, you may think this is not a big deal, but the literature shows that this actually messes up the tooth pretty good in terms of success rates. So it becomes a guarded prognosis as well. Finally, we have a situation where we do have a probing depth larger than five millimeters. And in these cases, it doesn't matter if you have a cracked distal marginal ridge or periapical radiolucency because the prognosis is automatically poor because a large probing depth at an isolated location is an indication of a deep crack that has led to bacterial infiltration on subsequent bone loss. And that's what these photos are really meant to portray because even with these three prognostic indicators in mind, we have to remember that the extent of the crack is also very important. As the crack extends deeper, we trend closer towards a non-restorable situation.
Okay, now switching gears to discuss the second special scenario of vertical root fracture, starting with how to diagnose this condition. And there are a few things to note about VRF, and the first is that it occurs along the long axis of the tooth, which means that we often have a lateral or J-shaped radiolucency on radiographic imaging as seen on the right. This is super important and you should certainly remember it for your board exam since it's a hallmark of VRF. Now sometimes vertical root fractures can be associated with a sinus tract or a severe periodontal pocket in an otherwise periodontally sound dentition. We generally refer to this deep isolated probing associated with VRF as a vertical step defect because you'll be probing the tooth and suddenly in one area your probe will sink in. And you may wonder, why do teeth develop VRF? And most commonly, it's due to excessive condensing forces during obturation of an underprepared or overprepared canal. So really, VRF is a problem uh, only with root canal treated teeth. You won't really see this condition with healthy teeth. All right, so how do we treat it? Well, it depends. If we have a single rooted tooth that has VRF, it's simple. We extract it. The VRF is a hopeless situation. But if we have a multi-rooted tooth, we could, keyword could, perform a hemisection or root amputation, both of which are just means to remove the involved root. But to be honest, guys, these types of treatments typically involve a specialist and extra cost, and they have poor results, so extraction is often the treatment of choice here as well. And the last point is exactly what I just mentioned. VRF as a hopeless prognosis. When you see it, it's time to start thinking of ways to replace the tooth rather than saving the tooth. All right, guys, that's it for this video. Remember these two cases as they can certainly show up on your examination and more importantly, in clinical practice. See you next time.